Consumers want natural. You want affordable and effective. Everyone wins when you breed with Afimel heat detection. Reliable heat-based breeding for high preg rates. That's the power of Afimel. Hello, I'm Matthew Malcolm with California Dairy Magazine, reporting to you here today from Tulare, California. I'm here with Shelby Myers uh, from Ever Ag. She came over from uh, Indiana to speak with us today at this dairy meeting. Can you tell us about uh, grain markets? Uh, we've had some interesting trends lately, and things going on in California, for example, our wet year is very different from uh, some of the other areas of the states. Um, so wanted to know what factors, based on your presentation today, what factors are influencing dairy feed prices, particularly on the grain side. Yeah, so we had a great opportunity to speak to producers about all the things impacting grain markets, and I kind of boil it down to five things that we're really focused on. Um, one of the first ones being that acreage dilemma, and that we're seeing you know, 94 million acres of corn planted across the U.S., and how that increased supply and the increased production over year over year is about up 10 percent, that that increase in supply is really going to help pull that corn price down. Um, we're seeing a lot of opportunities for corn overall to be planted across not only the west you know california's got year over year production up over a hundred percent but we're also seeing an increase of corn acres in that south and southeast and a lot of the things that i'm hearing from farmers across the u.s is that yields are better than expected which will help contribute to that increased production supply that'll also help bring that corn price down. But on the flip side, we're talking about soybean acres too and how we had to pull corn acres away from something and we pulled them away from cotton and soybeans and how that influences the soybean meal price for a lot of producers will be a very interesting development too, whether or not we have enough soybean acres to supply all of the demands that we have for soybeans, whether that be in the export market or in the renewable diesel soybean oil market. And some of those producers getting the co-product benefits of soybeans in that soybean meal. It's just the price uncertainty there is going to linger a little bit longer, whether we you know, import more soybeans or not uh, to make up for some of those demands. So we started there. Uh, I mentioned exports and we really had to linger on exports, uh, particularly on the corn side. You know, I call exports the most elastic demand line item for a lot of our commodities because it's really going to make or break a price. We saw corn exports and soybean exports really drive the price up in September of 2020, and we're starting to see the lack of demand for U.S. exports bring the price down, especially on corn. Our 2022 corn exports were the lowest they've been since 2012, and I think that's really driving a lower price, and we continue to see that into the next year. Um, I couldn't go through a presentation without talking about some of these macroeconomic factors. Interest rates are certainly weighing on producers' minds. For corn farmers in particular and soybean farmers, you know, that cost of capital is going to influence a lot of decisions, not only in the near term of whether or not you sell today or sell in the next contract, whether that be a March or a May contract, but it's also going to influence some planting decisions next year and what they can afford to plant and how they make those decisions moving forward, especially as you look at the balance sheet. Weather, as you mentioned, we talked about weather in the West has been a much improvement, as you mentioned. However, in the Midwest, they had the worst drought since 2012. It's and like everything just flip-flopped, huh? It absolutely did. It absolutely did. And so what we're seeing right now is we're kind of testing some of those corn hybrid seeds to see, did we learn anything from the drought of 2012? Are we a little bit more resilient and able to make up some of those drought deficits? Um, and I'm hearing a lot of people say that their yields are better than they expected. So will that contribute to that supply that we talked about or not? We're still in the midst of seeing that. The WASD tomorrow will give us a better glimpse of those results, but it's also influencing some of those grain logistics that we see. And with the Mississippi River levels low and moving lower, the basis levels are deterring farmers from selling grain down the river. Uh, that's going to influence exports, but it's also going to push feed westward towards uh, California and other states that are going to receive grain via rail. So we're going to see basis levels, you know, essentially incentivize that grain to move west. So we'll see basis kind of increase. Uh, and the last thing that we really talked about was just some of the uncertainty, the geopolitical uncertainty that we're facing in commodities, the U.S. domestic uncertainty that we're facing in commodities, and how that can really bring 
prices of all commodities lower and something that I think it's really important for farmers to be aware of is that we're at the mercy of the markets and so we might see a lot of the feed commodities have lower prices because of the fundamentals I discussed but we also might see all commodities be impacted by some of these challenges that we're going to face going forward. Right, including some of this uncertainty, the uh, the expiration of the farm bill you mentioned a little bit too, right? So how that might impact programs that are available for farmers as well, right? Yeah, we're absolutely concerned about that. I think as we watch the development of the farm bill uh, negotiations and how we get a new draft, some of the changes that they're looking to make there, there's obviously improvements for farmers that we'd like to see, but there's uncertainty in whether it continues and if they are able to pass uh, an an extension at the end of the year to make sure that the programs can continue as needed. Um, government shutdowns also threaten farm bill programs and some of those crop insurance processing procedures. And so everybody's got to worry about something. And that's certainly something that keeps me up at night. So overall, you know, with California, especially on the corn side of things, uh, feed availability and prices, you feel is we've got a, a pretty good trend though moving forward into the next year? Yes, I'm very optimistic for the California dairymen right now as far as feed availability as well as feed pricing. I think, you know, they've weathered the higher prices over the past two years, and I think it's about to pay off. We're seeing a lot of factors that are bringing that that price a little bit more bearish, and I think it's going to be a great opportunity for them not only to take advantage of opportunities now, but here in the next six to eight months, too. And compensate for some of the inflationary pressures that they've experienced over the last, well, year or so, right? Yes, yes. And and that inflation is still going to be built in, I think, for a little bit longer. We're certainly seeing that in the corn price. The way the balance sheet is set up right now, it it matches some of the years that we had corn that was closer to, you know, national average of $3.50 uh, and around that number. So we're still a little inflated there, uh, which is why I think some of these fundamental factors will help bring that price down. Um, but overall, I've, I hear a lot of optimism for uh, the input cost side of things for a lot of dairymen. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you, Shelby, for taking the time coming out here and speaking to our dairy producers today. Read more about these things in California Dairy Magazine. I'm Matthew Malcolm, CaliforniaAgnet.com.